What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another video. And I uh, appreciate anyone who sat through the last one. I'm sorry, I got a little rambly. I'm going to be working on it. That's, that's why I'm doing this, so I can improve and get better. Um, which is why I will not expand on that point for two minutes, rambling along. <laughs> um, but yeah, sorry it was a little bit rambly. Um, we're going to be a little bit more succinct today, a little bit more to the point. That way we can uh, I can respect you guys' time. The one thing I feel people don't do enough of in set reviews is they try to play out specific scenarios of how they see the card work out. And I just didn't have enough of those like worked out on top of my head where I was like trying to think of scenarios on the spot. Um, so if I don't have those on hand, I'll just, I won't <laughs> just slowly burrow my way through it. I'm just, uh, just going to move on. So yeah, because I just feel like context are the best way to understand like actual gameplay patterns help you differentiate between like actual theory crafting and understanding when it's at its best and when it's at its worst. I don't know. It's it's hard to explain, but I think you guys get it. So we're going to start with black. Hopefully we can get through black and Wooberg. So white, blue, black, red. Black and red for this. And uh, yeah, let's get into it. Alchemist Gis is single black for an instant. Targuchi gets plus one, one gains a choice of life, death touch, or lifelink. Limited. Archfiend's Vessel, single black for one with lifelink. When it enters the battlefield, if it entered from your graveyard or you cast it from your graveyard, exile it. If you do, create a 5-5 five, five black demon creature token with flying. Yeah, so the most obvious one here is Luris. They literally just put this in a set after Luris. Just don't know thoughts before Luris was even nerfed. That's They had this, they had the dog that sacks to give indestructible. I'll see it of Lice Bounty this up before. Gosh, they really wanted him to be just the new thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, here, here's a play pattern for you, right? Archie's Lessel in turn one. Priest of Forgotten Gods, turn two. Turn three, you play a land, you play an Archie's Vessel. So you have two mana up, two of these guys, and a Priest of Forgotten Gods. You sack both of them, you add two mana. So you now have four mana. You play a Luris, you play this out of the graveyard. You now have a Priest of Forgotten Gods, a 5-5, five, five, and a Luris on turn three. Now that's a dream scenario, but it's a scenario that could happen. I can't tell you how many times I've seen opponents do that with like gutter bones and stuff, you know? That's... <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, I mean you just play four Lurus main deck, four Priest main deck. That's pretty messed up. Or you're in the late game and you play Call of the Do Death Dwellers. Two of these guys are in your yard. Instead of grabbing your, your Lurus, you notice your opponent only has one card in hand and they're at ten because of your serrated scorpions and priests and mayhem devils maybe. Um... So you just pick these two guys. You get 10 power and toughness with flying, with evasion, on the battlefield. That's kind of messed up. <laughs> Don't you think? Um, so on its face, it's pretty bad. Obviously, you have to be doing stuff with it. Um, maybe you put in like a Soul Tide Command the Dread Horde deck for just for lols. Um, I don't know. That's one damage to get a 5-5 five five on the battlefield. That's pretty good. Um, and the life gain decks, it can trigger life gain. Like, the lifelink, a 1-1 lifelink for 1, like, was played sometimes in those decks. <laughs> so, it's not that much of a stretch. It's an uncommon. I think it'll be a really cool budget option for, um, budget decks. <laughs> um, so that's where I'm super interested in it. But yeah, I think it's super powerful. I just don't like it against control decks. In creature matchups, I think it's phenomenal. Because like I said before, with the white creature that makes pumps, that poops out angels, if you can make your 1-drop demand a removal spell that's like incredible that's really good for a one drop and so for creature matchups like mono red or like a mid-range matchup which we don't have a ton of right now um speaking of which yeah i need to pull up mtg goldfish standard decks and metagame there it is um maybe john sacrifice but this deck's already kind of vulnerable to that because they can just ping out all your pieces with mayhem devil and stuff Salty Ramp, Mono Red. See, so yeah, at this point, Mono Green and Mono Red. Maybe Mardu Knights, but they have Amber Cleaves. But yeah, creature based matchups. This just really helps you <clears throat> come up the ground to close the game up quickly in the air. And then also, they have to use removal. And in those decks, removal is a little bit more at a premium because they need to have a mixture of threats and removal. Control decks, they're just going to Teferi bounce it. They're just going to Brazen Bar or bounce it. You know? Um. If you attack with it, you're just going to swing back with like three or four Nissa lands and an Uro. Like, this doesn't block an Uro. It's, yeah. I mean, if they're just playing a ton of Dream Trawlers, this matches up pretty well against it. Because it doesn't get by ECD either. But there's just so many easy ways they have to get rid of it after you did so much work for it that I don't think it's worth it against Control decks. Okay, moving on. 
Bad deal is a bad deal. Let's go. <laughs> Blood Glutton is clearly limited. Caged Zombie is limited. Carrion Grub. Da 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 da. Limited. It costs four for an 05. That's too much. If it was three, because a milling four card is what you're in for if you're playing this. Where X plus X plus greatest power one creature cards in your graveyard. So it might be like a budget reanimator thing we could try. Because um, I could totally see. You know, this is like the super budget kil uh, Kiln Fiend. That's not it. Uh, fiend Artisan. <laughs> super budget Fiend Artisan. If you squint really hard to the point where your eyes are closed, it's it's a budget Fiend Artisan. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's really playable unless you're in the budget area. Crypt Lurker, three and black. When it enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice a creature or discard a creature card. If you do draw a card, limited. Death Boom, Thalid. Um, I could totally see myself playing this a little bit in like an Aristocrats deck. It's a budget option, or maybe come rotation, when we lose all of our really good one and two drops for that deck. It could be a thing, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it would be... You know, here, here's what I'll do. I, I had the rating system I wanted to do. A is it's going to be a staple. B is it'll see main deck play consistently. I guess it's kind of more stabilized. No, it'll, it'll, it won't surprise you if it makes main deck of like a couple meta decks. C is it'll see some niche play. D is it's a sideboard card. E is or F, it'll never see anything. This is like a D. Well, not sideboard. C minus. <laughs> some fringe tier two deck play. Um, Demonic Embrace, one black black for an aura enchant creature. Enchant creature gets plus three plus one, has flying, and is a demon in addition to its other types. You may cast Demonic Embrace from your graveyard by paying 3 and discarding a card in addition to paying its other costs. Interesting. Um, you still get 2 for 1 because you're discarding cards. Um, so you still have to, even if the creature dies, you get this back, whatever, it still costs you a card to get it back. So it's not like it's going up in card value. Now if you're discarding cards that want to be in the yard, that's interesting. I just can't think of any aura decks that want cards in the yard. Or um, constellation decks that really want cards in the yard. It is pretty cool with. Um, gosh, what is that? Oh no, how can I not remember this? Incarnation. Enigmatic Incarnation, I think. Um, the four drop enchantment in blue green that you sacrifice an enchantment and go find a creature. This is kind of cool for that, I guess. <laughs> But then at the same time, hmm, yeah, I don't know. It's an enchantment you can, you can recur, which is something a deck did not have. So maybe it's like a, a fun of or something. That could be pretty interesting. But also, I mean, it's a pretty fast clock, dude. You have a 1-1 one, one and you turn it into like a real threat. Um, so even if it's just preventing floating out in like a mono black deck where you just turn your land into this enchantment, it's pretty cool. The deck has enough life gain to pay off with this, to uh, level out with this, like Ayara. And... Um, Grey Merchant, things like that. It's pretty cool. I think I'd give this like a like a C minus fringe play in like tier two decks. Um, I could see, yeah, I'd give it like a C. You could see it pop up every once in a while, but I don't think it's amazing because you're still two for one in yourself. If the creature gets bounced, you're still screwed. Like I said, Brazen Borrower, ECD hits this. Um, and Teferi, which are like the three of the most played cards in the format right now. And that's the difference. People say, oh, dice to the removal isn't an argument. But either dice to every removal or dice to every removal piece that's played is an argument. Because <laughs> that would just mean that every time you play this, or like 90% of the time you play this, it just does nothing. Whereas in formats where, let's say, 40% of the removal can hit it, then hey, 60% of the matchups, if you have it, maybe it does work for you. That's the difference I would like to illustrate there. Cool art, duress, definitely a good card. Sideboard A+. Eliminates one in a black for an instant. Destroy target creature or planeswalker. With CMC 3 or less, excellent. I love this card. It is so good. Um, it's not great against things like Uro, or things that have already drawn cards and done what they've done, which is what most of the format's about. But I mean, dude, being able to hit both a Chandra on three or a Runaway Steamkin, or an Annex if you needed to. The, the flexibility is so good. Um, you could hit a Teferi, but not on their turn because Teferi is stupid. A Narset, 
You can hit a Narset, a Krasis, or an Uro. Like I said, Krasis or Uro or a Narset are things you don't want to have to hit with it. But the fact that your sideboard card against aggro or your main deck card against aggro isn't dead in that matchup is still phenomenal. Like, that's great. Um, gosh, and I mean, against green, this is really good against Stone Coil Serpent. Um, some Esper decks had an awkward time against that, <laughs> unless you draw like your Ritual of Soot or something, because your Oath of Kai's don't hit it, Tyrant Scorn, Mortify, nothing like that hits it. Um, yeah, this deals with that really well, deals with all the creatures in mono, mono green really well, mono red really well. It's an instant too. This is what I've been wanting. Black, like good, like when Fatal Push rotated out, there was just a hole that needed to be filled. Um, and this is going to do its part with it a little bit. And I'm really glad they're making Planeswalk removal a little bit more flexible. You're not just tied into it. And it's not always three mana, like uh, Murderous Rider, where it takes two life and sets you back so far and stuff like that. No. Planeswalk removal can be efficient and should be efficient. Because they already got an activation out of the Planeswalk no matter what. So <laughs> you, want, you want it to be a little bit better of an answer. So I love this card. This is an A plus to me. Um, you'll feel bad using it a couple times against like the Simic Threats. But it's just so versatile that you're you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to help yourself. In historic, this is gonna be amazing against all those low to the ground decks, the gruel decks, um, even some of the threats in the field of the dead decks. But not really. No, that's all Golos. If you need to hit a zombie in a pinch, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's so many historic creature decks. The um, affinity deck in historic. This is gonna be so good against. Um, you can hit the Steel Overseer before they untap with it, right? You can kill the Stone Coil Serpent, like I said. Ginger Root's done. I This is so flexible. You can also hit... I mean, you could hit like a Basri in the same deck that you're killing a Johnny's Pride Mate. Just all in one card. That's so good to me. If you have a Ritual sit in your hand, you play this and you kill their Basri. If you don't and you need to kill their Pride Mate really quick, then you kill the Pride Mate and then you use your Murderous Rider next turn for the Basri. I don't know. I don't know. It's... The flexibility is amazing. I love it. I'll stop. Ranting Fetid Imp. Um, bad card in IMHO. Budget Death Touch deck, though. Finishing Blow. Limited. Gloom Sower. 7 mana. Limited. 8 6 for 7 mana. Ugh. Gormand. 4 green, black black. Four, green green. 4 black black for a 5 5 demon. It's an additional cost to cast it. Sack a creature. Fly, flample. When it eats you bees, each opponent sacks a creature. 6 mana for a 5 5 flyer. That makes you even on sacks. Eh. Eh. Limited. Grasp of Darkness. Love it. Um, I think this is better until this trades up on mana. So let me put it this way. When this is starting to kill most, like 90% of the four and sometimes five drops played in the format, Grasp of Darkness is better. Otherwise, the other one's better. Which is a pretty straightforward observation. Um, for instance, this kills a Nightpack Ambusher. If that's a main deck thing, that's going to be crazy. Corvold, you can kill it with its ETB trigger on the stack. That's pretty powerful for two mana. Two mana. Um, at that point, it does have as, as narrow of a window as Heartless Act, where you could, could have killed it with Heartless Act. So, again, this is competing with two other really good um, two mana removal spells in black, which I love. That's what black should have. Thank you, Watsy. Um, <clears throat> trying to think what else. What other creatures? Uh, doesn't kill an Uro, which the other one does. Doesn't kill most Krasises. Um, let's see. Does kill Brazen Borrower. Gem Razor kills Pelt Bel Collector usually. Mayhem Devil. But this is all things the other card kills. Uh, Mono Red has all those. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can kill a Questing Beast. The two big ones I'm looking at right now are Questing Beast and um, I guess Corvold, but the other one still can kill him. And Nightpack Ambusher. Those are all huge. Um, the one thing, this is probably better in an aggressive deck for creature matchups, because then you can actually, you know, if they have a 6-6 six, six and you have a 3-3, three, three, then you can play this and you, if you then you can beat it in combat if it blocks your 3-3, three, three, you know? That's something that's really good. So that's an instance where I think it'd be better. Um, but yeah, that one's just so flexible and so cool. And the art's awesome. And I love it. 
and the even the the flavor is pretty neat. Um, here we go. Grim Tutor. One black black for a sorcery. Search your library for a card. Put the card in your hand, then shuffle your library. You lose three life. First of all, I love the alternate art, by the way. By the way. I love this card. It's so great. Happy to have it in standard. Um, this will go amazing. I guess this puts it in modern too, right? It wasn't in modern before this. Historic, it'll be fun. Anyone who's played Seasons Past, I entered a modern tournament a long time ago with a super, super budget version of Green Black, or actually it was Obs on Seasons Past, where you have your uh, Dark Petition, your Seasons Past, and what I, the other card I played. Let me know if you guys want me to do like a deck deck on this sometimes. Maybe I can find my paper deck. It was super cool. <laughs> um, and uh, another born Phalanx, so I could transmute to find the Seasons Past. But if you don't know how the deck works, I can explain in another video if you want. But pretty much, you search for Seasons Past. That card that you search for it with puts it, goes in the graveyard. You Seasons Past that card, you bring back four or five, six cards. Then you have the card that lets you search any card for a card in your deck. You search up Seasons Past. You empty out your hand, you play Seasons Past again. It's awesome. So this is going to work out really well with that. as Because you can pass Dark Petition, you have three mana floating. And then you can just use this to get fetch up your Seasons Past. Now you have two cards that fetch up in your yard, so now every time you cycle Seasons Past, you can also search for a different card in your deck, uh, a different Silver Bullets, and it's great. In Standard, this costs too much life and too much tempo. Against Control decks, there's not enough cards that are powerful enough that can throw the game in your favor. Like if you fetch up an Elder Spell, they've drawn enough cards off of what they're doing, or they have an ECD in play that's going to get back something... That's not going to do it. They probably have a crisis in their hand around the battlefield. You're not going to take care of their Uro and their Planeswalkers. Uh, unless you're like a combo deck. I don't really see this doing a whole lot. Maybe people start splashing black in their Wilderness Rack decks. That's a world they don't want to live in. And like That was a joke, by the way. Don't. <laughs> that's not genuinely what I think will happen. Soul Tie Reclamation, guys. It'll be a thing in standard. Um, <clears throat> but... I do love this card, but I just don't think it's playable right now. I'd see it as like a C or a D, really. Yeah, maybe a D, because he's some sideboard play. I'm going to play it. You guys know I love me just being able to fetch up anything in my deck. So I'm going to play it. Uh, Mono Black Historic. Yeah, dude, I'm all in. Cabal Stronghold makes this pretty much free. Pretty much free. Brian is like a two of in your deck. Yeah, that's cool. Three life, though, is a lot. That's like That's a lot more life than you expect. That's a bolt from your opponent. Which of the red deck, you just gave them a free card, effectively. <laughs> and they paid the mana for it. So, Meaning, if you, in that scenario, they drew a bolt, they cast it, and hit you for three. That's effectively what you let them do. Um, but anyway, cool card. Love that it's uh, a thing. Don't think it's going to be amazing. Hooded Play Fang, two and a black for a one four snake with death touch. Whenever creature you control with death touch attacks, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. Whenever a creature you control with Death Touch deals damage to a Planeswalker, destroy that Planeswalker. Here's my hope with this card. This bottom text here, and I'm not the only one saying this. I've thought this for a long time. Everyone has. Death Touch, this is how Death Touch should work on Planeswalkers always. Come on, man. Make it real. Just just reword it, right? Instead of damage to any creature is enough to kill it, damage to any creature or Planeswalker is enough to kill it. Not that hard. It makes sense. It's intuitive. No one's going to have to unlearn the old way for this. It makes sense flavor-wise. It makes those cards way more powerful and playable. Please. Please do that. Um, as for this card, the drain ability effectively makes it a 2-4. Um, because in combat, it's an infinity 4, effectively. Um, and then hitting people, it's effectively 1-4, but then this makes it a 2-4. It's pretty cool as a lord. Um, it goes well on that Vraska deck. <laughs> Which I think this might be enough to finally put it in there because now they're all hitting For at least two a turn and they're getting bigger every time they hit thanks to Vraska So that's pretty cool thing is in standard. There's a bajillion sweepers, right? A bajillion sweepers and most of death touch dudes are one ones or one twos or So it's gonna kill by clarions It's gonna kill by shatter the sky and you're not gonna draw cards it's gonna get killed by um, Flame sweep and like the top three decks all play those this has Flame Sweep or the um, four mana one, Storm's Wrath. This will have Shadow of the Sky. 
This has Mayhem Devil, who will just ping down everything anyway. Salt of Ramp will have Ritual of Soot. Um, one, two, three, four. So there you go. Mono Green and Mono Red, you might have a chance. Mono Red has too many First Strikers. And it has Embercleave. So, eh. Mono Green, it'll be decent against, I think. <laughs> so, there you go. <laughs> Um, so I don't think it's a huge standard thing, but in creature matchups with the Death Touch deck, it'll be sweet. So I'd give it like a, a C. It'll definitely show up in tier two meme decks. Infernal Scarring, uh, limited, but love the card. Caravic the Spiteful, this one's weird. Two black black for three, two human, legendary human warlock. Other creatures get minus one, minus one. So if token decks are a huge thing, I could see this in like my Captain Sisse deck. Maybe in the sideboard. As for standard, oh no, here's the thing, right? Unless you're a creature deck too. So it's very niche. So against creature decks, like mono red where this will work, or mono white where it'll work sometimes, a ritual of soot will do the same job or better, and it costs the same. Literally the same mana cost. And how often will that be way better than this? Because it'll take with them their Johnny's Pride Mates, it'll take with them their Sarah Ascendants that are bigger. It'll take out the Daxos, um, in case anything. Yeah, Daxos will just straight up survive. There's so many things that'll survive through that. Um, against Mono Red, a Steam Kill that's grown won't die. It can't activate its ability, which is cool, but it won't die. Annex will still survive. Torbrand will still survive. Chandra won't be able to make 1-1s, one -one, so that's pretty cool. <clears throat> um, Robber of the Rich, still around. Against Gruul, all it'll kill Lanor Elves or new Pelt Collectors, which is pretty, pretty neat. Um, but Pell Collector's probably going to be big at that point. It won't kill any of their hasty threats. It won't kill, deal with Questing Beast. It won't deal with any of those. And Ritual Soot will deal with a lot of those. Not the Questing Beast I just mentioned, or the Tor Brand or anything like that. But oftentimes you can count on the board being clear, or effectively clear at that point. This doesn't kill the uh, Stomp Giant, Bone Crusher Giant. That's a huge one. Yeah. Um... It's not even great against like affinity and older formats unless you get up unless you like growth spiral into this or land or elves into this, which feels super bad because then your land or elves dies. This just doesn't like it's not enough. I'd rather have a curse of death hole to be honest. Cause the decks that Cause the decks How do I put this? The decks that want to clear out creatures are in two camps. Either they don't play creatures themselves, in which case Ritual of Soot is better, or they do play creatures, in which case this will kill most of them anyway, on your own side. If not, it'll make them weaker. So it's like, it's such a niche thing that you want this to work out with. Um, it does set up like Edict effects pretty well for Priest of Forgotten Gods. But then you're probably having to play like two drops or weird one drops for them to stick around with this minus one minus one thing going on. So even that's kind of a weird thing to be looking for. Um, Brazen Borrower doesn't stick around, that's interesting I guess. But against the control decks, all this is going to do is just make your side weaker. A 5-5 five five Uro is still amazing. A 5-5 five five Krasis instead of a 6-6 six six Krasis is still amazing. A Dream Trawler with minus one minus one is still amazing. Um, it might be decent against the cat decks, and in that regard, Ritual of Soot might be worse. So there you go. But then again, this also dies to two Mayhem Devil Triggers. So, seems pretty easy to achieve if they have a goose out in an oven. Like, that's really all they need. <laughs> you know? They could sack, if they have a cat, Mayhem Double and Goose out, which is totally real board state, right? They just sack their cat before this resolves. Then they sack the food to either the cat or the goose. And then, well, I guess they already used their oven in that scenario. They let the cat die. Hmm. Hmm. You know what I mean, though. You know what I mean. The cat's already in the yard because they're playing smart. They're playing around Cry of the Current AM. Oh, in that scenario, you'd probably rather have Cry of the Current AM anyway. Yeah, there's just not... That takes care of the lures, too. There's just not... It's not. I'm gonna stop rambling. I don't think this is amazing. See? Yeah, I tell you what I'm gonna do, though. Cloning this, that's when it's cool. You can't clone it more than once, because then they'll all die. But this, spark double, boom, get it out there. That'll be pretty cool. That'll shut down a ton of decks. 
I could maybe see myself running like one of this in my Vanifar deck. <laughs> It'll kill all my land or elves, but I play more grazers anyway. So yeah, definitely a fan of it for that sense. So let me know if you're excited for that, because I definitely want that to be a thing. Okay, so Freebooter, definitely a good disruption piece in aggressive decks. And human decks are like a real thing in historic. This is already in there, but yeah, really good as an aggressive way to get on the battlefield and get over there. Um, White and Black has some Anthem effects going on now, so this could become like a real threat. Listen to Basri is kind of cool, I suppose. Um, just pumping it every turn with the Indestructible. Eh. If Basri said until your next turn for the Indestructible, then you'd be like just messed up good. And that would be amazing with this. But, I mean, yeah. Freebooter's gonna do some work for some, some aggressive decks, man. Some mono black aggressive decks, some black white maybe. Some knights might just throw this in there, I don't know. They're two drop slots pretty uh, gummed up already. But yeah, I would see this like a C. We'll see either like fringe play. Oh, and Caravac's like a D. Either weird sideboard play or no play at all. That's a weird Liliana. That's the dual deck Liliana. Dual deck card. Oh no, this isn't. This isn't dual deck. Liliana's Devotee. Two and a black for a two, three human warlock. Zombies you control get plus one plus oh. At the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, you may pay one and a black. If you do, create a two, two zombie creature token. Nice. So I don't think this is powerful enough for standard. Most of the removal sweepers anyway, or uh, exile effects to deal with escape creatures. So they're going to be exiling your threats. There's not a ton, like an insane amount of zombies in standard right now. Um, in historic though, this could be decent. Although I do think Graveyard Marshal is just better than this. <laughs> I don't know, it's a 3-2. So Graveyard Marshal is a 3-2. You could pay black black to exile a card from your yard, yard and make a 2-2 two, two zombie. Which being able to do that in retrospect instead of having to pay two mana every turn, like have two mana up every turn. And this is only on your end step. So if they kill something on yours on their turn, you can't do this. So at that point, you have to be playing like sac effects or something, or attacking in combat. So this feels a lot better to me on creature decks, because then plus one plus one makes your zombies attack, or trade up sometimes. And attacking and forces them to trade, and you can get more zombies on your turn. And a lot of your one drops and two drops will just trade up to be a 2-2, two -two, or even to be a 2-2. Two -two. So that's pretty cool. Like I like that with like gutter bones, which is a skeleton, not a zombie, right? So that's a bummer. <clears throat> um, yeah, I would see this as like a C in Historic and like a D in Standard. Zombie decks aren't really good enough, and spending two mana to make a 2-2. Two -two, I guess a 3-2 effectively, which is pretty cool. Like I said, the plus one plus zero thing is the one thing this has over Graveyard Marshal in my opinion. It costs three as well though. Graveyard Marshal costs two to play, I believe. That's huge. Three mana for a 2-3 is rough. Um, yeah, this is just not doing nearly enough for standard. And it dies to all the removal. ECD, Scorching Dragon Fire, Defin Clarion, Shatter the Sky, Ritual of Soot. Everything. Um, not profitably either. So yeah, no thanks. That's a dual deck card. Beginning of each end step, if a creature died this turn, you may put a loyalty counter on a Liliana's point. No. Liliana's standard bearer. Two and a black for a three one zombie knight. Flash, when it enters the battlefield, draw X cards or X's number of creature that died under your control this turn. Let's go, dude. This card's great. Um, when Teferi rota rotates out, it'll be amazing. For now, it's just it's just great. Like I would see this like um, maybe like a B minus or a C plus. So it'll see like f I think it would see fringe play in tier one decks, or pretty like good play in um tier two decks. Pretty consistent play in tier two decks. <clears throat> um, yeah, because I'm picturing you play this after a sweeper, obviously. You can play this after a hard combat in a creature matchup. You can play this. Here's what I like. Priest of Forgotten Gods. You can play this for one mana. Okay, so turn one, you play a one drop. Turn two, Priest of Forgotten God Gods. Turn three, you play a one drop. No, you can play two drop, even, or two one drops. I don't know. 
End of their turn. You sack two of your dudes, get two mana. With your one or two remaining mana, you play this. You effectively drew one off the priest, drew a card. Yeah, so you drew a card off the priest. This guy comes into play. You draw two more cards, and now you have a 3-1 threat you can start attacking with. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I'm a fan of that for sure. Um, Witches of Index. This is just a 3-1, three, 3-mana, one, three 3-1 three, one flash that drew a card. So in that sense, like, worst case scenario with this, I would see as a 3-mana, three 3-1 three, flash that draws you a card. I feel like that's pretty playable. Um, granted, the energy was a big component, but... Gosh, I forget his name. The 3-mana, three 3-2 three, that drew you a card when it enters and gave you 2 energy, that was, like, dominating standard that had to get banned. <laughs> Which I know the energy was a big component of that, but even without energy, like, that was still a very much a playable card. And that's like the floor on this. Um, people are going to be saying, hey, isn't Midnight Reaper better? This doesn't cause you to lose life, which is pretty neat. And um, this gives you a board presence after Sweeper. The problem is you have to hold up three mana to get out of this. But here's the thing. If your opponent's behind enough that they have to play a Sweeper, chances are you don't even need to have this in play. Right? Like, you can afford to hold up the three mana. Well, especially if you have Priest, because if you play a Sweeper, you just sack two of your dudes, and then you really only need to hold up one mana, right? That's a big deal. And a lot of decks that want to be playing this are going to be playing Priest. It's not insane that a, a control deck's going to be waiting. I mean, they'll probably bounce your Priest with Teferi or something, but it's not a surprise they're going to be waiting until you're amassing more to the board to want to shatter the sky. Because you have a lot of 1-1s one and 1-2s and... Two twos. You're not playing like a four three and a three one and nonsense like that. Um, so yeah, if your board stays big enough that they have to sweep, you don't have to commit enough to the board that it's a problem to hold up three mana. That's how I would say it. And then against creature decks, I mean, dude, you just flash this in, trade with a bone crusher giant, or uh, I don't know after combat. You could even if they have an ember cleave or something. <laughs> Well, I, don't know. I was going to say, you could flash it in between the first strike and second strike, draw a card off of that to try and find a removal piece to kill them before they trample over for lethal. That's pretty niche. Um, I don't know. I really like this card. Like I said, an important thing is that it does not deal damage to you like Midnight Reaper. And who knows? Maybe in a deck that's not playing Mayhem Devils and Lurises and has crazy amount of 3-drop uh, slots taken... You can just play this alongside Midnight Reaper, and that's a lot of card draw. But in any deck with a Witch's Oven, this is at least a 3-mana three 3-1 three draw card, which is fine by me. Liliana's Steward, black, 1-2, sack it, target, nope. Nope. If you didn't have to tap it, maybe? No. They just discard a card. You don't even get to... No. Like, you can bring it back with Luris, but you have Fenlurkers, you have Croxa, you have way better targets for that. Um, D minus, probably. Niche tier 2 or tier 3 decks, I think. Liliana, Waker of the Dead. 2 black black for 4 loyalty. Liliana, Planeswalker, plus 1. Each player discards a card. Each opponent who can't loses 3 life. Minus 3. Target creature gets minus X, minus X until end of turn, where X is the number of cards in your graveyard. Minus 7. You get an emblem with... At the beginning of combat on your turn, put target creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control against haste. What? Dude, I love Liliana Ultimates. They're always my favorite. The one from Origins, after you, you flip it over, where you get a creature back every turn, that was one of my favorites. I play that in Magic Duels all the time. So awesome. So awesome. Um, speaking of which, they should put that those Planeswalker cards in Standard, or at least the Liliana one, by the way. Dude, fetching that up with uh, Vanifar would be disgusting. Come on, dude. Oh, that'd be so good. Anyway, so the plus one is pretty cool, but a lot of people really like fueling their yard for Cruxes and Uros and nonsense or Lorises. So that doesn't really do a lot to your opponent. Um, against control decks, it's decent, but this gets hit by an ECD, and the minus three does almost nothing in those matchups. I guess if you're stretching, you can kind of kill an Uro. Maybe a Brazen Borrower, but chances are they're probably going to do it on a turn where they can just kill her when you, they untap. 
some creases will die to it. Um, if this comes down, you target like a mayhem devil. It's just gonna ping it in response and kill it. Um, yeah, bait ramp. I labeled everything. Team or wreck. Labeled everything. Yeah, not a lot in Jund. You want to hit with it. Hitting Gilded Goose or Cauldron Familiar feels bad. Mono Green, there could be decent stuff to hit. Sultai Ramp is pretty much the same to Bant Ramp. Mono Red could be interesting. It does make it so that Annex only makes one token instead of two. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking four for some reason. Um, because his power gets lowered, so then it doesn't rec recognize him having four or more power or whatever. Um, so that's cool. But, so can you expect this in turn four to be able to kill most of the stuff in the format that comes down in turn three? What's the biggest thing that comes down in turn three? Questing Beast? Gruel Spellbreaker? Uh, gem Razor? Auspicious oh, Star Axe. <laughs> um, yeah, if you build your deck around it, I think it could. Number of cards in your graveyard. So it didn't even need to be creature cards. So Mire Triton turn two, or a uh, Glow Spore Shaman turn two. Stitcher Supplier turn one in Historic, Mire Triton turn two. Like that makes this pretty powerful in that regard. So it can't affect the board when it comes down. I think you want to just build up to that seven. Um, the plus one is actually pretty good in my Obzan Reanimator deck. So maybe that's the thing I'd want to do. Because it lets you discard your flashback cards, your unburial rights, your whatever of the worm that makes like a 6-6 six, six worm for 4 mana from the yard, or like 7 from your hand. So that's pretty cool. Um, I kind of see this as like a C. I think it'll be kind of a role player, or uh, pretty neat in some fringe tier 2 decks. Although I was in historic, it might be like a C. No, C. So maybe like a C or a D in standard and a C in historic. That's that's my take. But I, I like, that's where I like Planeswalkers to be. I want them to be role players, not format defining every time. Malefic Scythe. One in a black for an equipment. It enters the battlefield with a soul counter on it. Equipped creature gets plus one, plus one for each soul counter on it. Whenever equipped creature dies, put a soul counter on it. So if a creature dies, you can equip it to a new one to give it plus two plus two. If that dies, a new one for plus three plus three. That'd be that's cool. Part of me kind of wishes. Eh, I was gonna say when you equip it, it goes to something else. When they equipped, when it gets unequipped from a creature, that creature dies. That might be kind of cool and a way to enable it all on its own. Two mana for an equipment that gives plus one plus one was kind of like the the staple, not the staple, but like the bar for standard for a while. I mean, we had the Ancestral Blade, <clears throat> which saw fringe play, by the way. And this is kind of similar, but also scales. And there's many decks that want their creatures to die. No, it's just equipped creature though. No, that makes me not like it. If a creature died, sure. Otherwise you have to pay one before you sack any creatures to put a counter on this. I just don't think that's good enough. Most of your creatures want to be utility creatures, not creatures just hitting in for a ton of damage. So spending a whole card on this to be able to get that, I don't really like it. You can get it back with Luris, but then you're starting over on, on counters, so that's not very good to me. Um, yeah, I think this is like a C minus, probably a D. D minus. <laughs> Fringe, unplayable, maybe a sideboard card in a tier 2 deck or something. Yeah, I don't know, dude. I'd rather be playing like a Fiend Artisan. Fiend Artisan is this, but with way more text. It gets you one big creature. You can cast it from the yard off Alluris, and it also helps you fetch up Alluris. And it helps you with all your other edict effects. If it was whenever a creature you control dies, this would be, I think this would be actually playable. But equipped creature just puts such a limit on how many counters you can put on it each turn, I'm not a fan. Master Black Guard, one in a black for a 2 1 flash. Okay, limited. Massacre Worm, yes! Three triple black for a 6 5 creature worm. Whenever ETBs, creatures your opponent's control, get minus 2 minus 2 until end of turn. Whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, that player loses 2 life. Yes! Yes! Okay, first of all, notice this is a static. It's not when this happens, so don't think of it like a Massacre Girl. 
They both massacre, so I can see why you'd take that. So that means in like a witch's oven deck, every time they sack their cat, they lose two life. They get one back from the thing, but they're still losing life from it. Uh, Priest of Forgotten Gods, they lose four life. Who, if they have a Luris out, a Cauldron Familiar with no oven or something, I don't know. Like a Luris, a Priest of Forgotten Gods, and with Summoning Sickness or something, Gutter Bones. Just like two or three cards like that. You play this, you swap to the board, they lose six life. And you're threatening to attack for six next turn. And the way they deal with most of your cards is by sacking their creatures. So they're going to take two, four damage like that. That's pretty awesome. I, I love this card. Um, this is totally going into a historic Journey to Eternity deck of mine. Or a Prime Speaker Vanifar deck of mine. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh you better believe it. This is way better than Massacre Girl for me. In that deck. Because that'll kill my Vanifar too. Um, but again, those are like tier two, tier two and a half decks. So that's not saying anything amazing. Um, against Mono Red, you want your sweepers to be coming down on turn four, turn three. Because you're dead. <laughs> um, let's see. Team Wreck, it does nothing. Bant Ramp, it does nothing. Jun Sacrifice, you'd probably rather have Cry of the Kernam or Ritual of Soot. Or you could play both. Maybe like four of those, two of this. Who knows? In Mono Black, it does add a lot more devotion. So maybe in that deck, it's a good sideboard piece or even main deck piece to help help you against Mono Red and Jund. Because those decks do a good job on stay, like interacting and gaining you life with like Ayara and Make Grey Merchant and other cards like that. Um, so in that regard, this is probably better for a creature mirror where you want to go over the top of them. Plus, it just makes combat a nightmare. You attack with all your creatures, so they have to trade off. Every creature they blocked with is an additional two life they lose. Um, so yeah. It hits a lot of the cards in Gruul. Um, especially Historic Gruul. All well, the Lantern Elves, Pulp Collector if it's early. Um, Burning Tree Emissary. The Goblin if they give, they give it haste. So that's pretty cool. I just think it's too... If you're a control deck or a deck that's not doing more interaction to begin with... You'd much rather have a sweeper, because six, turn six, and triple black. Triple black isn't what a lot of those control decks are looking to be casting off of. They like their shattered the skies and stuff. They want double white and double blue or double green, not triple black. Me being like the soul tie deck, because you can ramp up to this. Okay, here's what I think. I think this will either show up in mono black as a piece against other creature decks, or it will show up in... Soul tie in very fringe sideboard play because you can ramp into it. But again, chances are Massacre Girl is actually almost better for them at that point. But it is a huge clock. Huge clock. So, yeah, I guess in that regard, you give it like a C minus or C. It's like very fringe play in some tier one decks because of the soul tie. Or like a maybe a sideboard card in tier one decks. Or main deck play in some tier two decks. But yes, I love, love this card. In the uh, old Duels of the Planeswalkers decks, uh, games, this was in a couple mono black decks, and it was so good. So good, because that deck's... Here's something I did in that game. Turn one on the draw, draw a card, pass the turn, don't play a land. Oh no, put this into my graveyard, turn two. This or Grave Titan, turn two. My opponent plays a spell. I don't know, two mana, two, two or something, sure. To pass back to me. I play Swamp. I play Reanimate for one mana. Get back this or my Grave Titan. I have a turn two Massacre Worm or Grave Titan. It was a lovely time to be alive. Gosh, I miss those games. Those decks were so fun to play. Mind Rot. Nope. Necromentia. One black black for a sorcery. Choose a card name other than a basic land card name. Search target opponent's graveyard, hand, and library for any number of cards with that name and exile them. That player shuffles to the library, then creates a 2 2 black zombie creature token for each card exiled from your hand this way. So here's what you have to ask yourself. Is a 2-2 better than a card? Because the other version of this card in, in Stainer right now draws them a card if the card's in their hand. I think if you're a creature deck or maybe a mid-range deck, some deck where they're the aggressor, which is very rare because if they're like a combo deck, you're the one who has to beat them first, right? <clears throat> I mean, assuming you're a creature deck, right? Because if you have the cards to make the 2-2 just not do anything, 
then that's way better than them having a uh, a card. So if you have a Teferi, who could bounce it? Or if you have an O4 from a Birth of Miletus, or if you have a Yorion in play, or if you're a Yorion and you're playing Jeskai Luka, I guess, and you're blanking an Omen of the Forge, that's fine. Or you have an Oath of Kaya that you can blank off a of Yorion. There's, there's, the Yorion deck seem to have a lot of good answers with this to make that 2-2 two -two moot. Um, yeah, interesting. If you are Bant or Soltai, this does not attack through any of your Nissa lands, so that's fine. Your Pelucranos deals with it fine. Your Uros deal with it fine. Um, yeah. So maybe a sideboard piece in like Soltai casualties. I don't know why I said this for Bant Ramp, they're not playing black. Soltai casualties, Soltai Ramp. Maybe a sideboard card for the um, Team Erect matchup. Because again, if I'm banned, I'm just going to hold up four Dovin's Veto for their four exp expansion explosions. I have a video on here where I did that. Literally, we were both worried about decking. And all I did is I just made sure that every turn, I ended the turn with a Dovin's Veto in hand. And there was just nothing he could do. <laughs> and I won that way. Um, so maybe, since Soul Tide doesn't have that option, they can just play this with like a Mystical Scoop backup. And they don't have to worry about either their Uro or their expansion explosion but then again in sideboard games if the expansion explosion player is smart they're going to be playing different stuff like ambushers or nissas or relying on brazen borrowers for the win stuff like that so not great but i, I give it a c sideboard playable and maybe like one or two fringe tier one decks or uh consistent sideboard play in tier two decks like mono black Mono Black doesn't have answers like that to Team Erect, so maybe you side this in. You can deal with the 2-2 just fine. Peer into the Abyss, 4, triple black for sorcery, target player draws cards equal to half the number of cards in the library, and loses half their life round up each time. This is kind of a combo with that um, that mill card that was printed, the enchantment. Um, if anyone saw that in Versus Live, it actually worked once or twice, so that's kind of cool. Um, Not great, not great. Gets hit by, uh... <sighs> Excuse me, Dovin's Veto gets hit by Mystical Dispute. Not easy, but if you if it's turn seven, they're gonna have three mana up pretty easy. <laughs> um, negate, all sort of nonsense. Drawing half your cards is pretty cool though. Um, but yeah, I think it just costs way too much and doesn't affect the board. So, no thanks. The art is horrifying though. They did an awesome job. Pestle and Haze, one black black. All oh, creatures get minus two, minus two until end of turn. Remove two loyalty counters from each planeswalker. Cryer the Carnarium is way better, but it's rotating out. When Cry rotates out, this will see play. That's what I think. I think the two loyalty counters from planeswalkers, they've already gotten so much value, and if they know to play around it, they can just plus a couple times. If this is your only way... <sighs> so sorry. If this is your only way of interacting with them, this is not enough. Like, if, that, if you hope to keep planeswalkers in check with this, that's not... Not good enough. Maybe for like a black green mid range deck, and the minus two minus two is how you deal with opposing tiny creature decks, but your creatures still survive. And then this is a bonus to then deal with planeswalkers if it's in your main deck. Sure. But for now, I see this is like a D fringe tier two decks on the sideboard, probably. Or people who can't afford Cry of the Carnarium. Rise Again is just a basic reanimator effect. Meh. Sanctum, you know my thoughts on the Sanctums. I'm gonna try them out, they're jank though. Sanguine Indulgence, three and black. This spell costs three less to cast if you gain three more life. Okay, so single black. Return up to two target creature cards from a graveyard to your hand. Ooh. All right, this would be like a C because I think it'll see a decent amount of play in the black, white, or mono black life gain decks. Because three life, dude, that's the thing. That's what you're looking for. It'll help you get back your Lurus. Excuse me. You can attack with your Lurus to trigger this. Um, Revitalize triggers this. Like one mana to get back two things is insane. So, yeah. In standard as it is now, nah. This is this is small ball. You don't gain that much life, really. But I mean, in a deck that main deck Soren, four mana Soren, gaining three life is a cakewalk. Seems pretty cool to me. Um, Silver Smoked Ghoul, two in a black for a 3-1 zombie vampire. At the beginning of your end step, if you can three more life this turn, return it 
from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Pay one in black and sack it, draw a card. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is the card I was talking about with a lot of the other life gain cards. If this card is good, if there's cards that make this good, those decks will see play. Maybe not tier one, but definitely at least tier two. Because getting things from a graveyard for free is so insane. Such ridiculous value. Such ridiculous value. Um, and so even just imagine, like, if you have Sword in play and you have two of these out, which isn't crazy, you just attack with both of them. They trade, maybe, or they just die. You gained six life. Boom, you get them both on end step for free. For free. Or if you don't want the life, you tag with, you know, these two, maybe another card or something. They block these two guys. Your 2-2 two -two gets through. You pay for, sack both of these guys, draw two cards. You plus Soren for the last damage. You get both these back on end step. Like, those are real play patterns that aren't super far-fetched, right? It costs three instead of two, which is kind of um, a bummer to me. If this costs two, I think it'd be phenomenal. Right now it's just a, a good role player. Nice synergy piece. You can discard it and just bring it back that way, which I think will be a real thing those decks probably want to do. Like, I know you just bricks Mighty Reveler this in turn two, and then... Well, red is probably not going to be doing that, let's be honest. Black-white decks. But, yeah, dude. I think this this can do some things for sure. Even in, like, a... Like, you just act this to, like, a Fiend Artisan... And you go fetch up a creature that gains you life. Get this back. That's not a play pattern I hate. It's small ball for standard right now. It dies to cry a Cranarium real easy. Three mana plays dying to cry. And it being like the synergy of your deck. That's kind of a bummer. So yeah, I think I see this as like a C. If the historic life gain deck probably could get a lot of mileage out of this, I would think. Because they have that 1-1 one -one that gains life anytime any creature ETBs. Which makes it so easy to trigger this. So, yeah. Or a black-white aristocrats deck. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. Or even put this in, like, a broodmoth deck. Where you sack it, draw a card, it comes back. And then you could sack it to something else, or just sack it, draw a card again. And then, uh, I don't know, you attack with the broodmoth with the sword and play, gain three life, this comes back. Or you sacrifice a food token or something. Or, I don't know, man. I don't know. But this this is pretty powerful. Getting anything for free is very powerful. And like I said, this pairs well with the other historic card. The one from Ixalan, where it's a two mana two two you can play from your yard. Um for free. They're not for free. You can play it from a yard if you gain the life. So if you have these two in play, Priest of Forgotten Gods can sack this. If you gain any life from that somehow, you have the mana to Castillo the dude, and then you can just Use your remaining mana to gain life and bring him back. And that's just a free priest. Every single turn. That's disgusting. So, love the card. Skeleton Archer, limited. Spirit of Malevolence. Limited. Maybe very, very, very niche budget. Aristocrats decks. Tavern Swindler. Limited, but funny. I like it, but it's not a good card. Thieves Guild Enforcer, black for a 1 1 human rogue of flesh. When it ETBs another. When it or another rogue ETBs, each opponent mills two. As long as your opponent has eight or more cards in their graveyard, Thieves Guild Enforcer gets plus two plus one, has death touch. I think this card is terrible right now. Terrible. You ready? Uro, Uro, Uro. And guess what? It doesn't even get the benefits of A, they want to use their graveyard, right? So, you know, yeah, they'll help put stuff in the graveyard. But once they use their graveyard, everything else gets exiled. So you're feeling their graveyard synergies. And then you, like, it doesn't even get the bonus at the end of it. It goes back to a 1-1. Because they're going to be casting their Uros. They're going to be casting their Croxes. Loris helps get cards out of the yard. It's, it's, oh man. This dies so easy to a Mayhem Devil. This dies so easy to anything in Mono Red. This will trade up in Mono Green, but you have to kill a ton of their stuff already. They play all creatures. So they're not feeling the graveyard pretty easy. Um, this into Robber of the Rich. They then would have four cards in their yard. So you're halfway there. And that's like the most rogues I could think of. The ideal. Um, yeah. There's the one mana 1-1 one, one red. The red 
One mana, one one with haste. That's a rogue. Those are like the three rogues I can think of now. The fact that it's flash makes it a death touch. It's like a one mana removal spell, which is cool. Which is cool. But. But. In this deck, you're, you're not going to be killing a Brazen Borrower. It can't block. You're not going to be killing an Uro because since it escaped Uro, they're not going to have that many cards in their yard, usually. Bant Ramp, same thing. It's not going to kill with the Krasis. You don't want to be trading with a Nissa Land. Uro is already the same thing. Jund Sacrifice will just ping it down or attack in the air with a Corvold. Uh, Mono Green, maybe. Sultai Ramp, same thing as the other ones. And they have uh, Cry of the Carnarium. Mono Red, it's too slow. It trade doesn't trade properly with a lot of their stuff. A lot of stuff is first strike. I think this card is bad. I think it's straight up just bad. Yeah, maybe in like a creature matchup in like historic or something. Like a mono black deck against a mono green deck. Where you're removing enough of the creatures that then this becomes a two mana three one death touch. Which don't get me wrong, that's a good card. But that is such a niche thing that I just I don't. I think it's like a D at best. And it's in the same like it's not like Uro's gonna rotate out and this will stay in play. This rotates out with Uro, I'm pretty sure. So that's always gonna be a problem with it. Always. <clears throat> Village rights, one black for an instant as additional cost to cast it, sack a creature, draw two cards. Yes! I love this. I love this so much. This goes really well with Journey to Eternity. This goes really well with um, Witches Oven decks. It goes really well with Claim the Firstborn. Two mana, steal your dude, kill it, draw two cards. Seems good to me. It's instant speed for one mana, so it's really easy to hold up in response to your opponent's removal. It lets you dig when you just need to dig and find your Luris or your Priest or your Mayhem Devil. Um... Yeah, it just does so many good things for one mana. The two mana versions of this saw very, very nice play in token decks a while ago, in black white tokens. <clears throat> um, and one mana is very different to two mana. One mana is way better, so yes, love this. You can tell black's taking me a lot longer because I'm so excited for all the black cards. <clears throat> yeah, this card's great. I think it it would be like a B minus. It'll see consistent or fringe play um in some tier one decks like john sacrifice or uh rakdos or even mono black maybe i don't know and probably consistent playing some tier two creature based decks if 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 only me playing them if only me this card is excellent on right and do not lose sight of that um veto the one of the dusk rose two and a black for a one three whenever you gain life target opponent loses that much life three black black creatures you control gain life like until end of turn interesting people have talked about how this goes infinite with like a lot of like the not sanguine bond take effects well every time you gain life every time you lose life you gain that much life every time opponent loses life you gain life any cards that do that this goes infinite because then they both trigger each other repeatedly that's not in standard right now though um, this does make Aristocrats decks just kill your opponent so quick because you have um, the Blood Artist type card, you have this, and they just have a ton of sack outlets. It'll make you drain them so quick. So quick. <laughs> um, it effectively doubles the Quill Celebrant type effects. Um, it's too small ball in my opinion right now. It's not aggressive enough. It does make Serrated Scorpion deal 4 damage, which is funny. If you have a Soren, it's pretty funny. But then you're kind of mixing utility creatures and creatures with actual power and toughness. You should try to make this work better, because otherwise you're just attacking with a bunch of 1-1s one and 1-2s. Um, the fact he does enable himself with that 5-man ability is pretty sweet. But yeah, 3-mana for 1-3 is... ooh. That is a terrible rate on its own. So bad. Three mana four fours are seeing fringe play. Not even like good play, just fringe play. So that's terrible. You need this to come down and do something. It gets bounced by Deferi, bounced by Brazen Borrower, killed by ECD. So I'd see it as like a C minus. Fringe tier two deck play. 
Maybe if Black White Aristocrats is a thing. Walking Corpse, nope. Witch's Cauldron, uh, nope. But one thing I like about it, like maybe like a D, fringe, like tier three playable. The fact it costs mana to do it is so rough, but it actually gets you new material. When you're sacking cats right now, or other creatures to get the food, the only material you're getting is to make cats, or engine food to get, then get more material. This lets you draw new cards. It gains you life on its own, so if you have anything that procs, you can gain life without of, which is, uh, which is familiar. So that's a thing, but I don't think it's nearly powerful enough for standard. Or historic, really. One mana for it, ugh. One mana's good, it's just two mana to do this, ugh. Battle Rattle Shaman, three and a red. Beginning of combat, you may have target limited. Bolt Hound, three mana for 2-2 two, two haste and has Battle Cry. Um, maybe this, th okay, so you have this, you have Glorious Anthem, and you have Basri. Those three as the three drops for a token deck. I guess you're also going to want um, Legion War Boss too, though. That's kind of, that's kind of way better. So maybe this in like the budget version of that token deck, but then you still need Bosri and Glorious Anthem, so I don't know. In a red-white token stack, if that deck's good, this might be a one, two, three of in it. I don't know. But those other two drops I mentioned seemed way more, or three drops I mentioned seem way more powerful and way better. So, yeah, probably like a D. Bone Pit Brute, limited, Brash Taunter, four in red for a one, one indestructible goblin. Okay. <laughs> Whenever it's dealt damage, deals that much damage to target opponent. And you can have it fight other creatures, yes. It's a stuffy doll that can, if you're up against like a green deck, this is hilarious. Hilarious, they can never get rid of it. So at the very least, it's sideboard against mono green. Let's, let's just put that out there. Trample, I guess, makes it pretty, pretty uh, bad. <laughs> but I mean, you could just fight a creature and deal like six damage to your opponent for three mana. <laughs> if this didn't tap, it would be like messed up. Um... And what's even funnier, what's what's cool too, is it doesn't fight a creature your opponent controls. So even if you're the only creature deck here, you could fight your own creatures to have this deal extra damage to your opponent. And it's almost never going to kill any of your other creatures when it fights, because it's a 1-1. One, one. So that's pretty cool. Um, 5 mana is a lot for this. It's a lot. If it was 4 mana, I'd be like, yeah, sure. Um, So I don't think it'll be tier 1 at all. Because most of them just have like sweepers anyway. You could fight an Uro, I guess, but they're just gonna gain three life anyway. So meh. Oh. Um. I think there's a creature in Ixalan that when it is dealt damage, it has ferocious or whatever. When it's dealt damage, it untaps something. So you might have like a mini combo there where you can have this fight it, deal damage to your opponent. That creature triggers it, untaps this. You get to fight again. That still costs six mana to do it twice. So who knows how viable that is, but that could be some jank we try out. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's a really cool card, a nice stuffy doll. Um, I don't like that it's limited to red, but it makes sense flavor wise. And yeah, so like C minus. Fringe playable in tier 2 decks? Maybe. <laughs> or a really funny sideboard card in mono red if mono green becomes just the new thing. Um, Burn Bright limited. Chandra, that's the other one. Chandra, here we go. Three red red for five loyalty planeswalker. Discard your hand and then exile the top three cards of your library. Until end of turn, you may play cards exiled this way. Plus one. Chandra Heart of Fire deals two damage to any target. I said plus one for that, right? For the first one? The first one's plus one. Two damage to any target for this one. Minus nine, search your graveyard and library for any number of red, instant, and or sorcery cards. Exile them, then shuffle your library. You may cast them this turn. Add six red mana. Uh, five mana for a, a six loyalty walker is pretty good when it comes down. Here's how I kind of see this. I think this will replace... Um, experimental frenzy when that rotates. Um, five mana is a lot for honestly. If this was four mana for three loyalty planeswalker that ticked up, I think this would be better, like by like a lot. The five mana makes a huge difference. 
Because Mono Red doesn't want to work all the way up to uh, 5 mana. Unless it's a number cleave, in which case it costs 2. Haha. <laughs> um, but dude, the th three cards from your deck is insane. I could maybe see this more in like the historic uh, burn decks. Because they have more burn spells. And so that has... Oh, here, here's here's what I like about it though. It's effectively experimental frenzy. Because how many times on frenzy, unless you have a steamkin out, do you really play more than the top three cards of your deck? And I'm talking like non-land cards, right? Because generally you're hitting like one, two, or three drops, and you usually have like five or six mana, like the first couple turns it comes out. I just stop. Sorry, my cat's clawing the floor, like a bozo. And so, how many times do you have an Experimental Frenzy out and you just really want to deal 2 damage to the Planeswalker? Or you want to hit that Shock to deal the final 2 damage to their face? Well, I feel like this is one where you kind of get to choose between the two of those. Which, don't get me wrong, is a little less powerful, but it's more consistent. And uh, it does threaten an ultimate as well. So, I kind of see it that way, where either sometimes you'll play... A two drop a land and a three drop or a two drop a land and a one drop before you hit another land or you'll hit a shock which you're really looking for if you want it and then over the course of a few turns experimental frenzy threatens to you just have one big turn where you have a steam can out and you go through half your deck and that minus nine is kind of the equivalent so yeah i like that you can just ping stuff for two damage consistently it's not impactful enough because you have to untap with it. And against Bant Ramp, they're going to have ECD or Brazen Borrower. Against Team Rex, they're going to have Brazen Borrower or Storm's Wrath, I guess. But this ticks up, so never mind. But they'd hit with an Expansion Explosion. Um, let's see, against Rakdos. It'd be pretty good. You can hit their um, Priest. You can hit, it doesn't kill Mayhem Devil, which is a big downside. You can hit their Priest, you can hit their Lurus, you can hit their Scorpions, I guess. I don't know if you want to hit those. Um, heck, that deck might even play it. Jun Sacrifice might play it. <laughs> Who knows? Um, but yeah, I'd see it in Mono Red or Mono Red Cavalcade, maybe. But the plus one does nothing the turn you play it. So, it's a 5 mana thing that deals 2 damage every turn. Eh. 5 mana thing deals 2 damage every turn or draws you 3 cards and then threatens to ultimate. The ultimate's not really impressive to me. If you're in a burn deck, it'll kill them for sure. Because, I mean, what, you fetch up, like, 1 lightning strike and 4 skewer the critics. <laughs> and, oh, no, 2 wizards lightning and 4 skewer the critics. So, even if that 6 mana is the only mana you get to use, you're already dealing 18 damage. So in the right deck, it'll definitely kill your opponent. Um, if you're in like a multicolor deck, that'd be pretty bad. <laughs> but yeah. Huh. I guess I'd give it a C. I could see maybe sideboard play in tier one decks like Mono Red. And then um, <clears throat> fringe decks like Mono Red Burn in Standard or tier one decks like Mono Red Burn in Historic. I could maybe see like one or two of this in the main deck. Pretty cool. I like this as an area for Planeswalkers. Chandra's Fire Maw, Planeswalker deck. Eh. Chandra's Incinerator, 5 and red for 6-6 six, six elemental. This spell costs X less to cast, where X is the total amount of non-combat damage dealt to your opponents this turn. It has Trample. Whenever source you control deals non-combat damage to an opponent, it deals that much damage to target creature or Planeswalker that player controls. If you could go face with this, it'd be way, way better. Way better. Um, because clearly, I don't know, because you have to do enough to their face to make this cost cheap, but then they also have to have creatures and planeswalkers you want to deal damage to. You see how that's kind of messed up? Like, if you're a mono red burn and you're in a creature matchup, you're going to be burning all their creatures, right? You're not going to want to go skew the critics to their face when your opponent has a questing beast and uh, a gruel spell breaker and a pell collector out. You're going to control their board and then eventually burn out their face. Or if you got under them and you're on the play, sure, you'll go face. But then at that point, you'd rather have another burn spell than this. Because you need one to two burn spells. 
and then you need to play this, and then you need to untap with one to two burn spells in hand again, and they have to have a creature and or planeswalker out. And just, I don't really see the scenario or board state this happens. This gets bounced by Teferi. This gets bounced by Brazen Borrower. This gets killed by ECD. This dies to Shatter the Sky. Not Ritual Soot, not Claria, not Cry of the Carnarium. So that's interesting. Um, it is a 6 mana 6-6. Six, six. So in that regard, I guess you technically don't need to untap with the other spells. I, I It just needs so much to go right that I don't think I like it. If we had more stuff like these Planeswalkers that can deal not combat damage consistently, that'd be kind of cool. But we don't really. Like Chandra on three can help you cast cards from the yard to burn your opponent again. <laughs> but like, are you really doing it at that point? Um, Maybe this is the one place I could see it. Cavalcade decks? Because I guess turn one you go one drop, turn two you go cavalcade. And then double one drop haste, or vice versa. So you have to untap with this pretty much on turn four, with all your creatures in play. You get to attack, you get three or four cavalcade triggers. So this costs two. And then every time a cavalcade triggers, you pretty much turn this into a mayhem double. That's pretty cool. And because that deck wants to go face anyway. And it doesn't have a ton of creature interaction. So then you have this and Torbrand as your, your top end. Whereas this can actually end up costing like two or three. I could see that. It doesn't help the problem the deck has where it can kind of fold to, uh, you know, one cry of the Carnarium. But I guess, you know, it has Chandra for that as well for staying power. Okay. I think I'd give this like a C or C minus then. It'll see fringe play in like burn decks which is like tier 2, or Cavalcade decks, which is tier, tier 1.5, tier 2. That's probably the best place I can think of it being. Um, in Historic, the Burn deck might be good with this, because it has so many. It has Skewer the Critics, it has Wizard the Lightning, Lightning Strike. Just so many 3 damage burn spells that maybe this will work. Don't think it's great, though. Chandra's Magmut. Tap it to deal 1 damage. Target creature, Planeswalker, 2 minute 2-2. Two, two. Target player, Planeswalker. Cool for doing spectacle. I'll give it that. D. Chandra's Pyroling. One in red for a 1 3. Whenever source control deals non cabin damage, gets plus 1 plus 1. Double strike. Ooh. Dude. Okay. I think this is just a better Chandra's Phoenix. Maybe. It effectively gets. Well, plus 2 plus 0. Oh. Yeah, plus 2 plus 0 oh for every trigger because there's double strike. Chandra's Phoenix got th plus 3 plus 0. Um, but this costs 2. Which is huge. And it still triggers um, Cavalcade on its own. So yeah, maybe this and this can uh, both give Cavalcade some upgrades, man. Okay, yeah. In that case, I guess that makes it a C. Fringe um, could be a really good card in a fringe deck. Tier 2. Nice. Um, Conspicuous Snoop. Well, I mean, hey, also if you just... Put like a titan strength on this guy after shocking them or something that's a lot of damage dude okay this is where i'd put it um sorry my cat's freaking out clawing the bed pudge quit it um so this with the kiln fiend deck don't let me forget guys we definitely want to play that because then we just throw in some shocks because shocks trigger kiln fiend and all the things that make kiln fiend good would make this good as well. So, yep, we got it, boys. We have eight two drops that are good in that deck. Play some Lurises. Ooh, baby, let's go. Um, Conspicuous Snoop. Red, red for 2 2 Goblin Rogue. Play with the top card of your library revealed. You may cast Goblin spells from the top card, top of your library. As long as the top card of your library is a Goblin card, it has all activated abilities of that card. This card is clearly extremely, extremely powerful, but Goblins are not standard playable. In Historic, it'll do work. So, C. C, I guess. You have Goblin Matron. You have uh, Goblin, the four mana one, Ringleader. And this is just, lets you play Goblins from the top by itself. Very good in that deck. Very good. Um, yeah. C. Crash through. Uh, it's a reprint. 
fine for Phoenix decks, I guess. It was played early on. Hopefully, we have better options at this point. Destructive Tampering. Limited. Double Vision. Three red, red for enchantment. Whenever you cast your first instant or sorcery spell this turn, copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. Yes, please. Yes, please. This is, in my opinion, a better version of Thousand Year Storm. Because Thousand Year Storm required you to still have a ton of stuff in your hands, whereas this, you can empty out your hand to get to this, and then you just start going off after that. And each turn. So you could cast, like, uh, I don't know. Um, a Lava Coil on your turn, kill two creatures, and then if your teamer, Growth Spiral on their turn, and they both get copied, that's pretty sick. Pretty sick. It's not as combo-y as Thousand Year Storm, but it's just so much more consistent value that requires less of you, that that's amazing. And so, like I just said, where you have powerful effects on your turn and their turn, maybe you can then make a thing happen with, like, Finale. Cause, ooh, because if you copy Finale, the red Finale that lets you cast instant and or sorcery from your yard. Because <clears throat> then you have sorceries cast on your turn, instants cast on their turn, is what I'm saying. Which then plays into you wanting to play Finale. So maybe this could be like a niche sideboard card in Phoenix decks against like creature decks that don't have a lot of interaction. That'd be kind of funny. Because even just cloning your ops in that deck is pretty sick. Or your, um... Gosh, like Cathartic Reunion? Because when Cathartic Union gets copied with this, you don't have to pay the additional cost. So you're discarding two cards, drawing six, because it gets copied. That's pretty disgusting, in my opinion. Pretty disgusting. Um, yeah. So I'd give this like a C. Fringe playable and or playable and fringe decks. Like uh is it spells deck I would totally make with this. Just guy spells deck with this might be decent. I don't know, probably not. Um, even just mono red, not really. No, five mana is a lot for that. Um, teamer, a teamer spells deck I think would work because then you can ramp to this. Like I said, cloning ghost spiral sounds great to me. Um, yeah, yeah, seems super fun. So yeah, definitely gonna play around this one. Fiery emancipation, three triple red for an enchantment. If source you control deal damage to permanent or player, deals triple that damage to the permanent or player instead. Um, my response is we have Torbran. No thanks. This works with other colors, unlike Torbran, but it costs triple red, and Torbran just kills you anyway, so. Yeah, um, D. <laughs> Furious Rise, two in red. Oh, this is the limited one, yeah. Fuhrer of the Bit in red for enchantment or enchanted creature gets plus two plus two attacks each combat if able. Plus two plus two permanently and for one mana is pretty big deal. This is definitely a C in my opinion. Some fringe decks are going to want to play it. Maybe? Because I could see it seeing play in like my, uh, that blue-red um, prowess deck I was thinking. Because they trigger off non-combat cards. So just got their turn two, play this. It's a 3-3. Three, three. Plus 3 plus 3, so it's a 4-5 that attacks and loots every turn. That's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I would totally take that. But not... I don't know. Yeah, low to the ground... Non-creature spells decks will love this. Um, so like a C minus. Some very, very niche decks will play this. But other than that, eh. Um, Gadrak, the Crown Scourge. Two in red for a 5-4 legendary creature dragon flying. It can't attack unless you control four more artifacts. At the beginning of your end step, create a treasure token for each non-token creature that died. This turn. Sorry, I got a drink. Um, wow. <clears throat> well, first of all. It has the same Love Struck Beast effect, effect where it's a 3 mana 5 4 blocker at the very least. And that's power and flyer. So that's a good blocker against like even like flash decks. Um, it's a real threat. Like honestly, I could see you playing this in like Jun Food or Rakdos sacrifice decks. Because the food tokens do help it attack. And the creature's dying. give you treasure tokens which that those decks are kind of mana hungry sometimes man it lets you play alert get alerts in your hand easier it lets you play alerts and play a creature from it more easily i mean heck you could even just ramp so maybe you play this in like a more bonto bonto bantu <laughs> version of the deck sorry i'm very congested in the mornings <clears throat> so yeah 
that's interesting there. Hmm. Yeah, because it helps you ramp into Bantu. It also gives you a payoff for playing Bantu. And like I said, it just fuels for each non-token creature that died this turn. So your opponent creatures that died too. So to me, this even seems pretty good in, de in um, creature matchups, right? Like if your opponent's mono green and you're mono red, you double block one of their creatures, block another one with him. The creature that you block with him dies. The other two creatures you have dies. That creature they double block dies. And you get four treasure tokens at the end of the turn. That's a lot of mana. He can then attack on your turn. He has flying, dude. Three mana, five, four evasive flying creature. If you jump through a couple hoops, like, come on, dude. That's, that's good. That's good. Imagine if Vantress Gargoyle could always block. You know, if blocking wasn't an issue for it. That card would see a lot more play, I think. It would be, like, amazing. It would be tier one. But it would see a lot more play. And let's kind of feel about Gadrak. Also, I mean, as we have Vadrock, Gadrak. There's a lot of racks going on here. <laughs> In the recent sets. Um... But yeah, I actually really like this card. I think I'd give this a C as well. Which I think is actually kind of where you want cards to be. C or B. Consistent play in top tier. Decent play in top tier. Fringe play top tier or consistent play in fringe decks. That's where I want most cards to be. So yeah, I think this is way better than people are giving it credit for. Way better. Goblin Arsonist. Um, pretty good to have another option in like the sacrifice decks. Especially come rotation. Pudge, chill out. Stop. Don't even, I guess the worst. Okay, Goblin Wizardry, limited. Um, Havoc Jester, unplayable. Five mana Mayhem Devil, no thanks. Heartfire Emulator, one in red for two, two prowess. Hey, dude, this prowess deck's coming together, man. Pay red, sacrifice it, it deals damage equal to its power target creature or planeswalker. If this went face, come on, wizards. Why are you so scared to print stuff that goes to face? Come on, man. Um, that's really good, though. Because then you can just pump it up, attack, if they don't block. And then you can just sack it to kill a creature. It will then allow your other creatures to attack next turn. Um, if you're running out of cards, to then... Like, let's say you have, like, two cards in hand. They have, like, a 3-3. Three, three. You play them both. This is a 4-4 four, four now. You're out of spells. So you can attack with your creatures this turn, but next turn you're not going to be able to attack through because they're all 2-2s two again. Attack through, deal them damage, then after damage you sack this to kill the dude so that then your other creatures can attack and that's more damage in the long term. That's that's good to me. I think this is really good. This budget deck is really coming together, guys. So many decent prowess uncommon cards and all the damage spells are uncommons or commons. So yeah, the mana base is what I'd be worried about at that point, but that's fine. And it's a wizard. So this could probably even fit in with the, uh, the historic wizards deck, man. That's like tier four, but yes, please. Yeah, this is uh, C minus. Tier 2.5 decks will love this, but it will definitely see some play in those. Hellkite okay, Punisher, limited. Hubble Fiend, one in red, two, one, limited. Igneous Kerr, one in red, okay, limited. Carol Keep Disciples, uh, the Chandra thing, no thanks. Limited, or um, not limited, the uh, Planeswalker decks. Kinetic Augur, three in red for a star four. Human Shaman, Trample. Its power is equal to the number of instant sorcery cards in your graveyard. Ooh. When ETBs, discard up to two cards and draw the many cards. Oh, baby. So it fuels itself, so it's probably going to be at least a four mana two for a Trample, which is bad. If it had Prowess, which it kind of does it has kind of better prowess yeah i mean it's toughness doesn't go up but it's already a four toughness so i mean come on man um yeah again i think this will work in that budget prowess deck i don't think it's good enough for just about any tier two standard deck but tier 2.5 will be a thing um reanimator this could be decent you could discard your creature cards yeah, but then you're not pumping it. And really the only spells those decks play are the reanimation spells. Never mind, I take that back. Um, D plus or C minus for this one. Limited. Uh, limited. Five mana, gosh. 
You know how I feel about shrines. Scorching Dragon Fire, good to have it back. Excellent card. This is a B. Sees consistent play in top tiers. Shock, good to have me back. Kind of. <laughs> um, same thing. C or a B. Soul Spear, two and a red. Soul Spear, Soul Seer, sorry. Deals five damage target creature, planeswalker. That permanent loses indestructible until end of turn. Guys, we finally have a way to kill that goblin that was just printed. <laughs> um, so this is a neat way to interact with if people get rid of all seed and only play with that dog for Luris. This is a cool way to play around that. Also, three mana for five damage. That's not something that red has access to a lot of time. So that's an important threshold. Um, I really wish it did six, though. Because, you know, Uro... He just kind of defines the format so much that anything does less than six or doesn't exile is bad. Um, it'll kill Teferis, it'll kill Narsets, but they already got cards out of them. It'll kill Brazen Borrowers, but it's still kind of feels bad. Can't kill Uro, doesn't kill most Crisises. Kills everything in Jund Sacrifice, except the Corvold gets big. So, C, I guess? Fringe playable in some standard decks. I saw some versus live decks playing it. It's just a good rate on damage. Um, but at that point, I'd almost rather just play um, Palu uh, Perforos' Intervention. So, yeah. Spellgorge are weird, limited, or uh, part of my budget prowess deck. Stormcaller. Limited? All right, how much we got left? We're in T. Okay, so we're almost there. Subira, two in red for a two, three, hasty, legendary human shaman. Pay one, another target creature with power two less can't be blocked. One in red, discard your hand. Until end of turn, whenever a creature you control deals with power two or less, deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. Whenever a creature. So something to note, this procs for every creature that hits, so you don't just draw one card. If you hit with three creatures, you draw three cards. That's pretty messed up. So if he plays on turn 3, you untap on turn 4. At the very least, you could give two creatures unblockable and activate her ability. And draw two cards. That's pretty amazing. She also attacks for two of the turns she comes down, which is really good. <clears throat> she doesn't trigger Cavalcade on her own, but she draws cards off of pretty much every creature. That's, uh, yeah, that's something. That's definitely something right there. Oof. Yeah, I think this is... I want to give it like a B- minus or a C+. Plus. I think this is better than a lot of people are giving it credit for. 3 mana for 2 power haste is like pretty good. Not like amazing, but pretty good. The fact that you can even... Even if you don't activate the last ability, because people are like, Oh, it's so... To get this other ability to... But like, let's say you have two creatures out. This effectively just makes everything a 10 street dodger. You're attacking for like between two to four damage every turn, at least, assuming you only have two other creatures out. That's like, that's really good. Helps you pressure planeswalkers. If it could target itself too, it'd be disgusting. And then it just, it just does too many things. This is like the red questing beast. <laughs> there we go. We did it, guys. It has so much text, it just can't be that good. And so in a lot of red decks, I think it'll be fringe playable in tier one decks. I think Cavalcade might try it out. I think in Historic, it'll probably be quite decent. Um, but yeah, because it combos well with almost everything in red except for Steamkin when it gets bigger or Annex when it gets bigger. But it still works with Torbran. It still works with all of the one drops. It works with Robber of the Rich to help you cast spells. That's an important synergy right there. A lot of times you play Robber of the Rich, attack, get a good card, and then you'd have to sack, like, Suicide into a creature or something to uh, get the get to cast the spell. So I am actually I like this card. I think it'll see fringe play in tier one decks and consistent play in tier two decks. <clears throat> sure strike no terror of the peaks yes. Oh I'm so ready for this card. Three red red for a five four dragon with flying spells your opponents cast that target it costs three additional life to cast. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, it deals damage equal to that creature's power to any target any target they did it boys we can go face you know what i'm excited for with this vanifar team or vanifar can be a thing now boys or heck i'll just put this in in the banter soul tie versions of the deck 
I'll just fetch it up if I draw it. Whatever. I'll shuffle it back in or something with the Cavalier Gales. Or I'll just put Dryad in the deck so I can cast it. But my gosh, dude, because now any of the creatures I stack up can be removal spells. How neat is that? How neat is that? Chupacabra, kill your Johnny's Pride Mate, shoot down your, uh, your Daxos. That's pretty awesome. Um, sorry, my cat is morelling up the dog that we're watching for a friend. <clears throat> um, so, love this card in that regard. It's even just, if you want to tap with this at all, people are saying, oh, well, it dies to everything. It's like a Baneslayer Angel. It does a little more than a Baneslayer Angel. I find it hard, if you get one to two triggers off this, if you get two triggers off this, I don't know how you lose the game. I genuinely don't. Like, that is so much value. You're going up an entire card there nine times out of ten. Because anything with three power is worth a bolt, which is a card. Anything that's killing an opponent's creature is clearly worth a card. Or Planeswalker, right? Um, if you untap with this, if they kill it, they also get bolted. It's, okay, spells your opponent's cast, not abilities, right? So ECD or Teferi Bounce, you're getting nothing for it. That's true. However... However, if they use any spells to kill it, so if you're playing as any, like, Sultai decks or Team or Wreck, because to balance it with Brazen Borrower is a spell, I guess their Sweeper, um, the Swarm's Wrath, will kill it without, but either way, a Bolt is worth about a card in decks where you're going to face, right? Right? Because you're probably an aggressive deck with this. So they're pretty much treating a card to deal with it, some of the time, some of the time. And if they don't deal with it, you win the game. That's a pretty good bargain there. Baneslayer Angel doesn't always win you the game. Uro can outclass it. Um, a big crisis outclasses it. Um, if you untap with it, it doesn't just win you the game. To kill it doesn't cost you three life or a card or something. So yes, this will be. This is like a B. It will. It will. It'll see play in tier one decks. It'll see a lot of play in tier two decks. I think. But yeah, pretty decent play in tier 1 decks. Gruel, this would be amazing. Could you imagine playing this and playing a Questing Beast? Deal 4 to your blocker. Kill your Birth of Miletus wall. Attack in. Hit your Planeswalker. You're swinging for 9 because it's hitting 2. I don't know. It's oh, just any creatures. And people are like, oh, we well, have to have creatures afterwards. Yeah, in a creature deck. It's not that hard to have a creature in Gruel. It's not that hard. At least 1 or 2 after this. Like... Oh, maybe if this said, if when a creature enters the battlefield, if you have four or more creatures on the battlefield, this deals damage. Yeah, I could see that, because then you need, like, a whole lot of them. Like, just one or two. Oh, baby, I love this. And with Vanifar, it'll be so fun. So fun. All right. Yeah, or even put this... No, his flying. It's going to say Broodmouth deck. Ooh. Ooh, baby. Thrill Possibility, that's a reprint. Trader's Greed. Gain control target creature on the turn and have the creature against haste. Add two mana of any one color. Ooh. Wow. So it's effectively a two mana steel spell. I like that. I like that a lot. Claim the firstborn is too good right now, but if that rotate when that rotates out, if does it? I think it's thrown a vault drain, maybe? Otherwise, um, if bigger creatures you want to steal, just use this. That's really good. Two mana steal something is really good. Especially since that's usually a removal spell at that point, if you're doing this in like an oven deck. Transmogrify, this is pretty much Luka on just a sorcery. Um, if Luka's good, this is good, I guess. You can also hit opposing creatures with this, though. But what matchups would that be good in? I guess if you hit like a Luris, most of what they would hit, you'd rather them have than the Luris. If they have an Uro... Maybe they'll only hit another Uro, or, well, I don't know. If you play some Bant Ramp, they might other hit, either hit another Uro, or Crazes into Dies, that'd be pretty good. Or a Dream Trawler, and that would be bad for you. Sultai Ramp, they'd probably hit either the 4-mana 3-2, that you um, look at the top three cards, put them into two piles, and get one of them. Or a crisis. So yeah, if you can hit a crisis off this, it'd be good. If you know that a deck is only playing crises, but again, it could still hit another Uro, and that's really bad for you. Really bad. Yeah. So I don't think this is like a 
D to me, to be honest. Turn to Slag, it's limited. Turret Ogre, limited. Unleash Fury? That looks awesome in a prowess deck, dude. Because you target it, Kiln Fiend thing goes on the stack. It gets plus three, plus so. And then this trigger, and then this resolves, and then becomes an eight. Yeah. Oh, baby. Yep. C. Definitely going to be playing this in a... We'll see minus, maybe. That's like tier 2.5. Kiln Fiend and prowess decks. Let's go. But yeah. Um, it doesn't help, like, you'd rather have something like this give double strike, which is how it usually goes, in combat, because if you have a 3-3 three, three, and they have a 4-4, four, four, you'll still, tr well, okay, if you have a 2-2, three, three, two, two, let me put it this way, um, if you effectively use this and you have like a 6-3 and they have a 6-6, six, six, well, you'd still trade with double strike if it was a 3-3 three, three anyway. There's some combats where you'll trade in combat with this where a double strike would have actually saved your creature or death such creatures or stuff like that. That's all I'm trying to say. Um, but if you're trading up that high, then yeah, with double strike, it would have done it anyway. This is amazing with Embercleave too, though. That's disgusting. Maybe a little too cute, but yeah. Volcanic Geyser, X damage to any target for X red red. Pretty cool. Um... Maybe it's just like another win condition in like the team of rec decks. I give us like a C or C minus. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if it does see play at all, but it could be fringe in like some burn decks or team of rec just getting really cute. Volcanic Salvo. 10 red red for sorcery. Spell cost X less to cast where it's the total power of creatures you control. Deal 6 damage each of up to 2 creatures and or planeswalkers. There we go. This can kill an Uro. And in Gruul, if you have 2 creatures out, you can play this. A Gruul Spellbreaker and a Questing Beast. That's 8 less. This costs 4 mana. Yeah. People are like, oh, it's too cute. You'll never be able to cast it. Well, yeah, but if you're Gruul and you're an empty battlefield already, you're probably not going to win anyway. This is also much better in my opinion because it doesn't deal go face. In my opinion, this is way better in creature matchups, obviously, um, where they have less removal and interaction. So this will be an amazing sideboard card in those matchups. Could you imagine like a 3, 4, even 5 mana just kill two of your things? That's really good. Like let's say you're up against, um, I don't know, like mono green. Kill your Nyssa, kill your Yorvo. That's pretty good. Kill your Nyssa, kill your Vivian. That's really good. Or kill both your blockers and then attack through and kill both your planeswalkers. That's really good. So I think Gruul decks will love this. Um, maybe the weird red deck that has things like the Chandra's Phoenix and the the Chandra's Incinerator, the things where you get really big cards into play, or cards with big power and toughness by cheating them in through non-creature spells, maybe that, but otherwise I think Gruul is just absolutely at home with this, or like a weird team or creatures deck, team elementals, because they can ramp really high for this, they are starving for removal, and their creatures get pretty big. They ramp really well because they have um, Risen Reef and Cavalier of Thorns. And a lot of the creatures get really big because of uh, Omnath. There we go. So yeah, I'd give this like a C. I wouldn't be surprised to see like one or two of these show up in some Gruul decks. Which is a thing. Might be too cute alongside Embercleave, but we'll see. Excellent cyborg card. There we go. Red's done. This card. Ooh, baby. I have a lot to say about this card. Um, so yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Next time we'll finally get through green. And then colorless. Or multicolored. And then colorless. And then we're done. So, awesome. Hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know what you guys think. Otherwise, I'll catch you in the next video. Thank you so much. And uh, hope you have an excellent day.